Okay. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you from uh, about a 13 hour time difference away. I'm in Iowa City, it's very early in the morning. And uh, I have such fond memories of my trips to Almaty. And uh, it's wonderful to be in conversation with Ayona and uh, Yuri and Anton and uh, so many of you. I'm, my topic, uh, the topic that Yuri gave me was to speak on multiculturality. And uh, the way I've chosen to do that is through uh, a combination of some stories about my own apprenticeship as a writer and my thinking, if, if there has been some kind of development of thinking, uh, and by looking at some uh, important poems in a recent American literary history. It might seem a little odd to have somebody who looks like me, a straight white male of a certain age, uh, talking about multiculturality, but I'm hoping that my experience uh, will prove useful for those of you who are trying to think about these issues in your own writing. I am what uh, many people in America would say is a product of a white privilege. I was born in Massachusetts, raised outside New York City. I am what is called a WASP, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Uh, the, let's see, I'm a member of that uh, part of the population that has held power for a very long time in the United States. And uh, a group, let us say, that uh, whose power has, has rightly been challenged. Uh, and this has led to lots of interesting kinds of tension in contemporary American society. You may know about things like Black Lives Matter, uh, which was inspired by the police killing of an African-American man named George Floyd. And that is perhaps the, the largest, most uh, uh, de the demonstration against a certain way of acting in American life, counterbalanced by the insurrection on January 6th, uh, when Donald Trump's uh, legions invaded the U.S. Capitol for the first time since the War of 1812. And uh, many, th these were people who were upset that Donald Trump had not been reelected. But even on a larger scale, these were people who were largely upset about the demographic changes underway in the United States, and the, which have been signaled far in advance by rather larger cultural advances and changes. Uh, the population of America, around 330 million people, of whom 60% now are what would be called white, another 18%, 19% would be classified as Hispanic, perhaps coming from Spanish-speaking countries. Uh, were born into Spanish-speaking families. 12.5% uh, would be deemed African-American, uh, mostly descendants of uh, the iniquitous slave trade of the 1600s, 1700s, and into the 1800s, which of course caused the American Civil War. Uh, and then about 1% Native American. Those were the original inhabitants of the United States. The United States is a country almost made up entirely of immigrants. That's what we are as a people. This is sometimes referred to as a, multi, as a melting pot or a mosaic of different peoples. We have at least 170 different ethnic groups in the United States. English may be the the, so the unofficial language uh, it's spoken by the majority of Americans, but many, many other languages are, are part of our national experience, prominently Spanish. 
So these are some of the things that are in the air for anybody trying to write in, uh, in, uh, in this day and age. And I'm gonna take a look. I'm gonna begin by with a poem by the late Michael Harper, an African-American poet and uh, it's called American History. It's very short. I'll just read it aloud to you. Those four black girls blown up in that Alabama church remind me of 500 middle passage blacks in a net underwater in Charleston Harbor so red coats wouldn't find them. Can't find what you can't see, can you? Now, let me just point out a couple of, uh, make uh, 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 try to tease out some of the meanings of this. Those four, four black girls blown up in that Alabama church. These were four little black girls who were blown up in a church in the 1960s. It was one of the inaugurating events of what we call the civil rights movement, which resulted in 1964 in the passage of uh, what's called the, the, the Voting Act, the Voting Rights Act, which made sure that African Americans uh, throughout the country would have what was rightfully theirs, free and easy access to voting for the candidates of their choice. We had fought an entire civil war over uh, what what uh, Harper calls here the Middle Passage Blacks, the, the African slaves brought to the United States came by means of what was called the Middle Passage, a gruesome uh, way to transport uh, slaves by sea, many of whom would die along the way, crammed into the bottom of these leaky ships. And eventually, uh, in 1861, the U.S. would fight this uh, terrible, terrible civil war that cost about uh, 800,000 Americans their lives in a country of 22 million people. Mind you, uh, during the uh, 1990s, uh, when I covered the wars of succession in the former Yugoslavia, uh, the population of, of the former Yugoslavia was also about 22 million, as it was in the United States during our Civil War, and 150,000 people died in, in the Balkans, uh, which is considerably fewer than what, uh, how many died in our country. I mention that just simply to say that in some ways the war, the Civil War in the United States has never really ended because pretty much every family here at that time uh, lost somebody in some way or another or knew someone who they lost. So, so that, that scar on our national uh, identity is, is prominent. And when, he, when Harper says the middle passage blacks in a net underwater in Charleston Harbor, Charleston is South Carolina, the place where the Civil War began when the Confederate forces, the Southern forces, uh, fired on Fort Sumter, and then the fighting was underway. The, the redcoats that Harper mentions here, those would be the British soldiers. The, uh, we had fought a, a, almost a century before a war of independence, uh, the American Revolution from the monarchy in England, in, and there in our constitution, we laid out that idea that all men are created equal. Of course, that wasn't true then, and it wasn't true after the civil rights, after the Civil War, though 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments were passed to get us closer to what we would like to call a more perfect union, we, we began to repair the damage, if you will, of the Civil War, but that did not mean that the uh, full equality and rights had been granted uh, to African Americans. The, the real, the vote, the right to vote would be held off for uh, a considerable time during the period of Reconstruction. 
uh, and it was not until the 1960s with the, the civil rights movement that we began to make real progress in uh, granting the full rights of citizenship to African Americans. And that, of course, spawned a counter reaction that came to fruition, if you will, uh, during the January 6th insurrection where supporters of Donald Trump uh, attacked the US Capitol for the first time since the War of 1812. Uh, these are pretty pro prominent moments in American history, the Black Lives Movement on the one hand, the January 6th insurrection on the other. Uh, so that's sort of the background to me talking about Michael Harper's poem. So, so then what happened is that, uh, uh, as I, I was saying, that uh, I, I, had, I had been born into relative privilege uh, growing up outside of New York City and had the good luck to attend a Middlebury College in Vermont, a small liberal arts college where I went originally to play what Americans call soccer and the rest of the world calls football and to be a French major. But over the course of my time there, I found that my, my love of writing became the most important thing, writing poetry and prose. And so I did what many young American writers do, which is to go to graduate school to pursue either a master's of arts or a master's of fine arts in creative writing. And one of the schools that I applied to was uh, Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. So I made a trip to Providence to meet with Michael Harper, who was at the time the director of the creative writing program at Brown. And uh, when I arrived, he, he, he showed up quite a bit late, you know, close to half an hour late. Uh, and it, it seemed to me that he didn't really want uh, to meet with me. It was a rather tense situation. And we started talking and he, he said, oh, so where did you go to school? Where do you go to school? And I said, uh, Middlebury College. And he immediately said, oh, do you know the poetry of Robert Hayden, a significant African-American poet? And I said, well, I, yes, I know some of his poems. And he said, Robert Hayden was denied service at the, the uh, Middlebury Inn. That's the local hotel in in Middlebury, and it was when uh, Hayden had gone there to teach at the famous Breadloaf Writers Conference. And Harper said it in such a way that he, he seemed to be suggesting that maybe I had something to do with Harper being denied uh, service. And after a little while, he looked at me and he said, you know, I, I don't know why I'm telling you this, this S-H-I-T, that I don't know why I'm telling you this shit. And then we went on and, uh, you know, what he, what he, what he was telling me something that has stayed with me ever since. He was looking at me and what I think I imagined that he saw was one of those many privileged young white males who uh, go through life without any understanding about what uh, life would be like for Michael Harper or any number of African American uh, men, women, and children. And of course, he was right. And it's a story that has stayed with me for more than 40 years. And it's why I wanted to begin today's talk with that story, because uh, it, it has haunted me all this time. And I want to turn next to look at a poem by Robert Hayden, that same poet who was denied service at the Middlebury shamefully, illegally, so many years ago. And this is his poem, uh, Those Winter Mornings. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue, black, cold then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking, 
When the rooms were warm, he'd call. And slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Now, what Hayden is doing in this poem is just recounting uh, memories from his childhood. Uh, it's clear that his relationship with his father was perhaps a little bit tense. And uh, we notice from the very first line that he's uh, beginning, he, he, he begins with a small head of steam. Sundays too, my father got up early which suggests that the other six days of the week, he got up early to go to work, to provide for his families, for his family. Sundays too, my father got up early, insinuating that the rest of the family can sleep in and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. Now blue black is actually not a, a word. Uh, ordinarily you would have a hyphen between blue and black, but he he jams the words together to give us a, a, a sense of, of really of how cold it would be. It's dark out, the light hasn't come up, the sun hasn't come up yet. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather. So the father's a laborer, uh, not really far removed. His, his father would have been a slave. His mother would have been a slave. That is to say, Robert Hayden's grandparents, laboring probably not for very much money, probably didn't have much of a chance to get an education and would work all day, all week long to make the banked fires blaze. That is to say, he, he piled the wood and started a war, started a fire. No one ever thanked him, including the poet. I'd wake and hear the cold, and notice how he has a stanza break there. So the first stanza is just about the father. The second stanza begins with the speaker introducing himself. He's a boy. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. So there's a way in which the father is breaking up the cold. He's also bringing light and warmth to this household. When the rooms were warm, he'd call. And slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. That's a pretty interesting line, fearing the chronic angers of that house. It, it also metrically happens to be the first perfectly iambic pentameter line fearing the chronic angers of that house. Well, not quite perfect. The first foot is inverted, but that's a perfectly acceptable uh, variation in this line. I, I mentioned that because I want you to know how, how very carefully Hayden could modulate his tone and the rhythms and cadences of the poem. He knew exactly what he was doing. The chronic angers of that house, we can assume perhaps between the mother and the father, perhaps the father's anger at the, the, the family, driven perhaps by just the pure exhaustion of working so many long hours at a physically difficult job. And so he's, the, the boy is rising and dressing and he's hoping that nothing goes wrong. There won't be an argument. We have a stanza, a stanza break. And we have speaking indifferently to him. So now we've had the first stanza gives us the a portrait of the father lighting the fire. The second stanza has the boy waking up, rising, and getting dressed. In the third stanza, we have a kind of interchange between the speaker and the father, but it's sort of interesting. Speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold, that is, he had made the house warm, cleared it of all of its cold, and also 
he's polished my good shoes as well because they will be going to church. It, this is a Sunday. Uh, so the father's made the fire. He's polished the boy's shoes. And he, he replied, and he thinks, what did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? In this last line of love's austere and lonely offices, this is the second perfectly regular iambic pentameter line. The first one being uh, the one I mentioned in the fearing the chronic angers of the house. Now we have of love's austere and lonely offices. By offices, what he means here are the almost the, the offices of a Christian uh, mass or liturgy, okay? And the love's austere, austere, that is to say, stripped down, bare, almost nothing there. We talk sometimes about austerity measures that a government will take to cut back on spending. In this case, he's pairing love's austere. We always think of love as being a kind of amplitude, a, a bounty. But in this case, it's a man who's got to restrict uh, the, those acts of love to starting the fire in the morning, to polishing the boy's shoes for school. What did I know, the boy asks. What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices, the father having done all of this in private by himself in silence? And it occurred to me after I had had this encounter with Michael Harper, that those last two lines uh, are lines that have stayed with me ever since. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? In my mind is as much, what did I know of the suffering of the millions upon millions of African Americans and uh, Hispanic Americans of who, among whom I live? Well, it would seem to me that the rest of my life, uh, I would be having to learn about that. I, the a wonderful American poet and Nobel laureate Louise Glick mentions all, has mentioned in an essay the importance of what she calls corrective readings. That is to say, reading works that are not exactly your cup of tea. If you like to re read a certain kind of poem and write a certain kind of poem, she's suggesting, uh, go in a different direction. Read poems that you're not necessarily interested in reading. Read Michael Harper. That was part of what I had to apprentice myself to. Read Robert Hayden. That was part of my education. Wasn't exactly what I would reach for in the first instance, but over time I began to see that I could school my imagination in a larger multicultural understanding of the world than what I had been born into as a white man of a certain amount of privilege. So what did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? I ask myself that almost every day. Okay. I hope this is making some sense. I'm trying to talk about the growth of one poet's mind in, in the midst of a society undergoing large cultural transformations uh, that will, the consequences of which will ramify for a very long time to come. So now I'm gonna flip over to a poem by Joy Harjo, who was our most recent uh, poet laureate and she served three terms as the poet laureate. She's a Native American poet uh, who uh, attended the Iowa Writers Workshop. I've been friends with her for a very long time, and uh, she is a she is a truly remarkable poet, a saxophone player, uh, activist, and uh, lots of other things. And this is her. This is only. This is part of her. Uh, the first of, of of just some lines from her first and perhaps most famous poem. It's called, She Had Some Horses. She had some horses. She had horses who were bodies of sand. She had horses who were maps drawn of blood. 
She had horses who were skins of ocean water. She had horses who were the blue air of sky. She had horses who were fur and teeth. She had horses who were clay and would break. She had horses who were splintered red cliff. She had some horses. She had horses with long pointed breasts. She had horses with blue brown thighs. She had horses who laughed too much. She had horses who threw rocks at glass houses. She had horses who licked razor blades. She had some horses. And then this goes on for another page or two. And part of what she's doing in this poem is she's, uh, well, you, you can see from the repetition how she's structuring the poem. She takes this idea, she had some horses, she had some horses, and repeats it over and over again. This is a pretty typical uh, rhetorical device employed by poets who uh, choose not to work in traditional English meters, uh, but in free verse. It's a way to get a, have a poem hang together uh, with, a, with, a, with a little more life. And I'm going to have to pause for just one second because uh, the small catastrophe going on here has uh, grown larger and I'm going to have to try to figure out what's going on. So I will be right back. Ah, so the, the beeping you may hear in the background is uh, this domestic drama has, has uh, reached another level that the, the, the water leaking from the washing machine appears to have shorted out um, uh, our electrical uh, smoke detector. But maybe it will stop. I'll keep talking though until it gets till the house bursts into flames, then that will probably be the end of the lecture. But what I want to go back to with what is, what's Joy Harjo done with this, uh, with this poem is to use the horse, which is a, 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 a common trope when we think about, Amer about Native Americans, them having horses. But what she's going to do is turn the horse on its head give us lots of different ways to think about different kinds of horses that, and, and it begins right from the first line. She had horses who were bodies of sand. Well, that's a pretty surreal kind of an image. She had horses who were maps drawn of blood. Well, those maps drawn of blood, of course, are the, the new cartography of the United States of America, which became possible only through the forced evacuation or, and or genocide of the original inhabitants, the hundreds and hundreds of Native American tribes that uh, filled this whole, uh, this land in such interesting ways. And I want to say, tell uh, just a, to give a larger, uh, put this into a slightly different light from a personal perspective. I had always loved Joy's poems. Uh, but it was uh, about seven, eight years ago, I embarked on writing a new, a new book, a biography of a poet named, of a, well, a writer uh, and important colonial figure named uh, Roger Williams, who was the, uh, a part of the Puritan migration to the New World in the early 17th century, who wrote the first important book about Native Americans. He mastered the language of the Narragansett Indians, an Algonquian uh, language, and wrote a book called The Key into the Language of America, which was a kind of phrase book of the Narragansett language and an ethnographic study of the Narragansett people. So he described in what looks like a phrase book uh, of all transliterated into English, all of the words and phrases you would use, for example, during a funeral, during a marriage ceremony, during hunting and fishing rituals, in trading, the currency that you would use. He's, he's, use, he's using, giving us the phrases for those uh, that the Narragansetts would use and he creates really the first ethnographic study of Native Americans. It was a huge hit in 
uh, in, in London when it was published in 1643. And it was important for uh, Williams's other political project, which was to secure a royal charter for the, the new land he was, the new, let's say, political body he was creating in Rhode Island. He had been banished from Massachusetts Bay Colony by the church elders because he thought, you know, we don't really have title to these lands because our king is not the true vicar or representative of Christ on earth, the Native Americans have as much title to these lands as we do, and perhaps even more. Uh, because, he, and because of that, he developed the idea of the importance of what he called liberty of conscience, freedom of thought, that was eventually translated into the separation of church and state that is at the foundation of the U.S. Constitution. It is what makes Americans who we are at our very best. We guarantee the right to freedom of speech, to freedom of assembly, of protest if necessary, and the freedom of religion, which is to say to practice whatever religion we might want to practice or none at all. So uh, it, it is in reading and writing about Roger Williams that I'm coming to a un different understanding of the ways in which our history, which is beset with so much conflict, might have unfurled in a different fashion. Joy Harjo is really one of the great examples of it. And, and I want to turn now to this little poem of hers called An American Sunrise. You can think of this as a different way to imagine American history. We were running out of breath as we ran out to meet ourselves, we were surfacing the edge of our ancestors' fight and ready to strike. It was difficult to lose days in the Indian bar if you were straight, Joy is bisexual. Easy if you played pool and drank to remember to forget. We made plans to be professional and did. And some of us could sing so we drummed a firelit pathway up to those starry stars. Sin was invented by the Christians, as was the devil we sang. We were the heathens, but needed to be saved from them, thin chance. We knew we were all related in this story. A little gin will clarify the dark and make us all feel like dancing. We had something to do with the origins of blues and jazz. I argued with a Pueblo as I filled the jukebox with dimes in June. Forty years later, and we still want justice. We are still America. We know the rumors of our demise. We spit them out. They die soon. Now, this is a prose poem that Joy Harjo has written, and it imagines, as I said, a different kind of history for the American project uh, uh, in, in the midst of being in a bar and uh, trying to uh, make sense of the, 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 the seemingly senseless tragedies that have befallen her and her people, she continues to listen to music and to try to tease out some meaning to find pattern in, the, in that experience and turn it into poetry. We spit them out, she says, those rumors of her, of her and her people's demise, they die soon. And with that, maybe I'll, I'll stop and open it up to questions. Hi, Christopher, my name is Messiah. Um, very nice to meet you. I'm one of the translators. We, uh, are having now a workshop provided by Nina Murray, who is the AWR. Uh, it's called Almaty Translators. It's, it's being held for the first time in this year. I'm sure you know that. So, my question was um, I don't know if it's a question, I would say that it's a rather uh, observation because when I read the, the poetry you have presented uh, on, on the screen, um, maybe I am wrong, maybe I'm mistaken, but uh, every time I read the poetry in English, it seems to me 
that it's, it has less right uh, rather than to say it's in, uh, it's in English poetry or Kazakh poetry. <laughs> I was just wondering if you speak some other languages you could compare it to, or maybe you have heard of this subject before. So if you could share your experience. Thank you very much. I, I think you've made a very wise observation. Um, I, I was uh, Joseph Brodsky's student, so uh, I, I know the, the dim view that he took of much American poetry. Uh, which uh, in, for the last 50, 60 years has, has largely dispensed with the traditional prosodic elements of verse, rhyme, uh, and meter. English is a rhyme poor language, uh, which doesn't mean that you can't rhyme in English. We have hundreds of years of extraordinary examples of that from Shakespeare and John Donne in Milton down to Wordsworth and Gerard Manley Hopkins and in our own time, a poet like Richard Wilbur. But it is true that for the last 50, 60 years, the received style, the dominant style of American poetry has been one form of free verse or another. Uh, you'll notice that if you dispense with uh, meter and rhyme, you uh, of course, you limit some of the possibilities of what you can do in a poem, which is why a poet like Joy Harjo might devise uh, a repetitive structure, anaphora. She had some horses, she had some horses, and the, the musical uh, imp uh, importance <coughs> of that line is, is a function of the variation. The thing of it is, is that... Um, so if you dispense with meter and rhyme, you find other ways to have a poem hold together. The last poem that I read there by uh, Joy Harjo was a prose poem. Uh, and that's a very popular form among American poets today. And in that, of course, you have, you don't even have the benefit of the, uh, of the, of a line break. Uh, the poem can be set up as, as justified. Um, and so you use things like imagery, uh, imagination, fantasy. You try to bundle a bunch of different ideas together in one poem. It's a different way of proceeding in, in poetry. But it's, it is it, that uh, what has happened in English has happened in many other languages as well. Uh, this fall in the international writing program we are hosting, uh, four different writers, uh, four different Arabic writers, all four of whom, to one degree or another, write uh, what Arab poets call prose poems. That is to say, they write in free verse. Uh, some write in classical Arabic, uh, some write in the vernacular or demotic Arabic. But it's interesting to me that all four, in one way or another, uh, imagine themselves to be writing free verse. Of course, we know how uh, French poets have done that and German poets have done that. It's, it's a part of contemporary uh, poetic practice in many traditions. And, and I just would conclude by, conclude by saying that the, some of the most interesting poetry written today is by uh, a gay African-American poet named Carl Phillips who majored in classics in Latin in college and who uh, works a little bit between formal and informal structures uh, with the most inventive syntax of any uh, any poet working today. So, uh, you know, it, it's just a way of saying that the, the free verse revolution expanded the repertoire for poets working in a variety of idioms. Uh, and provide different ways of proceeding in a poem, formal and informal. Hello, oh, Chris. Uh, thank you for your interesting pieces of poetry that you shared with us. I have a question. Uh, how can a Kazakhstani authors or poets be translated and published in America? Um, do you have to be like already successful author for that? To have like an auditorium or 
um, publications in journals in advance? Um, and is there an interest uh, among American people, among and Western people in Central Asian literature in general? What do you think? Well, first, the, the, the first key seems to me in uh, getting poems translated or published abroad is that you find somebody who likes your work, who wants to translate it, right? And then uh, you have a good working relationship with that translator. And then it's up to the translator to find um, uh, journals and to pu publish the uh, translations in books, book publishers to publish books of them. And in my experience, um, although not a great deal of work gets translated into English from Central Asia, uh, poetry lovers, poetry readers, poets themselves are always eager to learn about new, new poets, uh, new poetic traditions. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, every day I, uh, am, I, I scour the Poetry Foundation website, uh, another uh, website called Poetry Daily, uh, and just to see what poets they have out there. And anytime there's a new, a new poet uh, from a different language that, that I don't know, I'm, I'm keen to find them out. So, you know, it's not for everybody, just as poetry is not for everybody. But um, uh, if, you write, if you write something original and get it translated pretty close to uh, faithful to the original so that a, an editor can, un, can immediately recognize that they are hearing something new, something vital, something that they really need to hear, then it will get published. Uh, there's, there's a new poetry press called World, World Poetry uh, published out of the University of Connecticut and I, I get all their books because every book introduces me to ways of proceeding in a poem that I had not ever imagined possible. And, you know, that's what, for those who work as editors, the, the, the greatest delight of all is to find a poet whose work speaks directly to you in ways that you had not imagined possible. A poet who, who breaks something open inside you that you didn't know needed to be broken into. So uh, uh, I think poetry is a large and forgiving place uh, for hearing something new from Central Asia, perhaps from Kazakhstan. I just wanted to say again, that's me again from the science work. Uh, I just wanted to highlight again Joy's poetry because uh, I can see some familiar things like horses. Horses are sacred animals here in Central Asia. And there is actually a theory that Native Americans migrated like uh, centuries ago from here, from Central Asia. So I think it would be a good idea to have a translator here. I think it would really resonate very well. Thank you very much. I, I, you know, I think you're exactly right. Uh, I remember, I, well, I grew up, I lived in uh, New Mexico for many years, and uh, I got, became familiar with the Pueblo culture. I went to the winter dances, the spring dances. Uh, it was, it was really important to me to, to learn about that. And the first time I traveled uh, in China, I was in a kind of remote area and they introduced me to some dances by one of the ethnic minorities. And I thought, oh my God, this is the same dance I have seen in New Mexico. And there's certainly uh, just uh, in, in terms of physicality, there seems to be a relationship. So um, uh, it, it's, it's very easy to imagine. And, and I think many archeologists believe that uh, a, a very long time ago, people came across the, the Bering Sea and ended up uh, populating uh, North and then South America. It's, uh, uh, and that, that was the world that, alas, was to a considerable extent uh, destroyed by uh, my ancestors and their, and their ilk. Uh, and that's why today I find it so heartening to 
to read Joy's poems or uh, to read uh, 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 Jennifer Forster's poems. Um, there, there's a whole, uh, or N. Scott Mamaday or Leslie Marmon Silko. They're doing things that, that, that we all need to hear. Uh, we have a comment in uh, Facebook stream. Uh, Kelly Dwyer, uh, uh, Kelly Dwyer writes, I agree with Christopher. There is an interest in reading Kazakhstani literature. People want to read different voices. Thank you, Kelly, for, for your comment. For sure. Nothing else. Someone else. I, I can say that in our program right now, uh, we, we have a Kazakh playwright and uh, she's been the life of the party. So, uh, Anwar Kamir, and uh, we, we, we really love her, her plays that are, that, are, that are funny in ways that we had not uh, imagined before. Okay, we have uh, one more question. Uh, hello, Chris, my name is Adrian. Can you hear me well? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So yeah, as I said, my name is Ivy. So would you mind uh, telling more about the IOPA Rice Presidency? I mean, the requirements, the application procedure, as well as, as, the, as, well as the deadline. Uh, we, the University of Iowa has a number of different uh, creative writing uh, units, let's say. I direct the International Writing Program, which uh, hosts writers who have published at least one book. And the way that works is that uh, embassies and consulates around the world are invited to nominate writers who have uh, published at least one book to be uh, considered for the International Writing Program. That uh, those nominations are due, generally speaking, in uh, March. The date changes every year because of uh, it's it, it, it's a it's a, a program that's generated by the U.S. State Department, so it goes on its own uh, timeline. Um, so, if you've published a book, then you're eligible for our for our program. But we also have the very famous. Uh, Iowa Writers Workshop for poets and for fiction writers. The deadline for their uh, applications, uh, I think, is mid December or possibly the first of December. For that, you have to have uh, three letters of recommendation, a transcript of your uh, your college or university uh, courses, and then a writing sample, which. Uh, for poetry it might be 25 pages or so, for prose it might be 50 pages. That's a similar uh, application process for our nonfiction writing course and for our uh, uh, MFA program and for our uh, playwriting MFA program. Each, each of these programs is housed in a different part of the university. And we also have a translation MFA program and for that you you have to have mastery of it, at least one other language besides English, uh, usually two, I, it might be two, and you provide a sample of your translations of, and the originals of the work that you propose to translate during your, your studies here in Iowa. And if, if you're interested in, in these, these kinds of matters, uh, at, in uh, uh, Maryland, uh, we have a thing called the Associated Writers and Writing Programs, AWP. If you Google Associated Writers and Writing Programs, you'll, you'll have access to uh, this umbrella organization for all of the writing programs in the United States. And there are about 350 graduate creative writing programs in the US and about 650 undergraduate creative writing programs. Uh, the AWP website can you can there you can find access to the different programs so you can see at a glance what the different requirements are for different programs. That's a pretty useful way to see how how it works. You can also get a uh, uh, a membership and there's a reduced rate for those who are uh, wish to get a membership from abroad. It's, it's, it's well worth it. 
it'll give you a, a big picture of the whole creative writing discipline in the United States. <laughs>